Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Glad you can join me this morning. Let's go ahead and start with our housekeeping. I want to make sure that you can all see and hear me okay. Morning, Jeremy. Glad you can join us. Let me know if you can see and hear me all right. You know, every single time I've tried to, you know, see, can you see and hear me? The answer is always, yeah, I can see and hear you just fine. The one time I didn't do it, I didn't have it set right. So just kind of irony there. Okay, Noel and Timothy and Noel just said yes. Can see and hear you just fine. Fantastic. Then, bam, let's go ahead and jump right into this. Hey, Hayden, glad you could join us. Okay, today, here we are. We're right here. Today, we're talking about dogma. Okay, now, I'm going to totally define dogma throughout here. But I want to remind you that this is kind of a segue from critical thinking um, and, and kind of taking a look at critical thinking in a deeper way. So with that in mind, let's remind ourselves what critical thinking is all about. This is what we talked about on Tuesday, um, if you were live or if you watched it later on, could have been any time. So let's remember what critical thinking is. So, and I am going to pull up my handy dandy little uh, highlighter. We'll get the highlighter going. Critical thinking is self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, and self-corrective. By the way, this term self-corrective, we're going to really get into today. So put that in your head there. In other words, it's about identifying thinking errors in ourselves, not others, okay? It's about looking at our own thinking errors. And we talked about thinking errors on Tuesday in our last lecture. We talked about if we accept a falsehood as truth, that's a thinking error. Or if we reject a truth as false, then that's a thinking error. And we kind of gave some examples, and I took you through kind of Paul Odellini, the CEO of Intel's examples. Again, we were pointing at somebody else, which is not critical thinking, right? But I wanted to do it to kind of show how it affects business and so forth. And Paul Odellini was a freaking genius. He's amazing and fantastic. But that doesn't mean that he's immune to critical thinking errors. We all, all exercise critical thinking errors, okay? So critical thinking is about calling out our own egocentric and sociocentric thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes. Egocentric, hey, Aaron, glad you could join us. Egocentric meaning, okay, I believe this and I need to hold on to this belief because it's who I am. My, my sense of self-worth is tied into this, right? And sociocentric is I belong to this group. And so I need to do everything I can to protect and defend the values and positions of this group. So both of these positions holding on to our sense of self-worth and ego, as well as holding on to, you know, the, the dogma of the group. Again, dogma we're going to discuss. This closes us off to critical thinking because, hey, sometimes we're wrong. And you know what? Sometimes the group is wrong. And critical thinking helps us come to terms with this. Okay? So, with that... Let's go on and introduce an idea, okay? Let's explore this postulate. A postulate is a position that I am asserting, a posit, an idea that I am presenting to you as truth, okay? Which is not to say it is necessarily, again, critical thinking. So we're going to examine this postulate. Um, the laws of science are self-correcting, and laws based on dogma and axiom are not self-correcting, okay? So let's look at what this means. 
Hey, Jason, glad you could join us. Fantastic. All right. So first of all, science. Let's look at science. Science is the intellectual, practical activity um, encompassing the systematic, follows a process, follows a system, right? The scientific method. The systematic observation, measurement, experiment, and formulation testing and modification of hypotheses. Hey, Mario, glad you could join us. Okay, so what does this mean? All right, well, you guys know what the scientific method is, right? So you come up with a hy hypothesis, right? And you kind of go, I think that, uh, I don't know, my garden isn't getting enough water. That's my hypothesis. That's why my tomatoes aren't doing well. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to observe and measure the amount of water that these tomatoes are getting. And so that's easy enough to do. We can, you know, put out a little measuring cup that, that you know, collects water from the sprinkler system. We can observe the sprinkler system going at the time that we set it for, and we can measure the amount of water. And we find out, well, holy heck, it actually seems to be getting plenty of water. My hypothesis that the garden wasn't getting enough water doesn't hold up against scrutiny. I have observed the water. I have measured the water. So now I need to modify my hypothesis. Well, maybe it has something to do with the pH balance of the soil. So I get a pH balance kit. I test the soil. And lo and behold, yeah, the soil is majorly acidic. Okay, acidic. So that's the scientific method. You totally get it. It's self-correcting in that when something that we observe, hey, Jamie, welcome. When something we observe and measure does not support the hypothesis, we don't change the measurements or the observations to fit the hypothesis. We change the hypothesis to, you know, more closely align with what has been objectively observed and measured. Okay, you get all that. Well, then what's dogma? Well, dogma is a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. Oh my gosh. Okay, let me let me dig into this bad boy. Okay, first of all, laid down by an authority. Well, I have authority issues. Okay, so who? Who's the authority that laid down this principle? Okay. Let's set that aside for a moment. Incontrovertibly true. Okay, I want you to embrace what incontrovertibly true means. It means it cannot be disputed. It is self-evidently true. Therefore, any questioning, any skepticism, any um, critical thinking applied to this principle is completely unwelcome because it is incontrovertibly true. Well, since it's incontrovertibly true, it's not self-correcting because there's nothing to correct or so it thinks. We don't like dogma. We're going to dig at this, okay? So dogma is when somebody says, here's a principle, um, you are not to question it. You are not to practice skepticism, skepticism or critical thinking because it is true, because I said it's true. We all know it's true. Stop questioning it. It does not require correcting because it's true. Well, that's an issue. Okay, that's dogma. An axiom is very closely related to dogma. What an axiom is, is a statement, kind of a motto a slogan, if you will, that uh, is regarded as being established, accepted, and once again, self-evidently true. Because it's established, because it's accepted, it is self-evidently true. You are not invited to question this axiom, this slogan, this motto. Okay, so to help you with this, let me give you some examples. And then I am going to ask you to come up with examples. 
So as I'm showing mine, kind of take some notes and kind of think of things that come to your mind on things that may be asserted as dogma or axioms. So let's start with dogma. Regulation hinders growth, stifles innovation, and makes things more expensive for consumers. Now, this is an assertion that is regularly kind of posited by the conservative side of the political equation. Don't worry, we're going to pick on the progressive side here in a moment as well. So the idea is we need to have a complete free unfettered market, laissez-faire, left to go, you know, do what it does. Um, because otherwise, if we try to put in place regulation, it's going to hinder growth, it's going to stifle innovation and make things more expensive. And this has been kind of said and asserted so many times that it is seen as self-evidently true and incontrovertibly true. So when it's called into question, it's like, what are you doing calling this into question? Everybody knows it's true. Really? Are you sure? Okay, we're going to look at lots of examples throughout these lectures. The private sector is more efficient than the public sector. Okay, so if you want something done right and efficiently, it should be part of the public, the, the, the private sector done by business for a profit. Whereas the public sector, public services and so forth, government and so on, um, they're not really interested in efficiency and, and so forth. Now, here's the thing with both of these statements, just between you and me and everybody else on social media watching this, you know, 99 times out of 100, I sort of agree, which is kind of the thing about dogma. Most of the time, it can really kind of be supported. But that means that there's one time out of 100 where it is not necessarily true, and yet we're not allowed to look at this because this dogma has been asserted over and over and over. Jeremy says, 20 years in the military, agree 95% of the time public sector does it more in a more streamlined fashion. Um, and that's going to give us a contributor, an awesome comment. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm going to also give that a real world example. Um, here's the thing. Yeah. Most of the time, yes, but most of the time is not the same as every time. And when something is asserted as dogma, it starts to feel like every time. Okay, let's keep going. Um, if you're smart, work hard, play by the rules, you'll be successful. You've heard this. You've heard this a thousand times that, you know, hey, if you're just smart, you work hard, play by the rules, and everything will eventually work out. And then, nah, nah. You significantly increase your odds of being successful. I believe that. But remember, belief is not based in fact. We talked about that in our last lecture. I believe that if you're smart and you work hard and you play by the rules, you'll increase your odds of being successful. But that is no guarantee. And yet this is often given as a guarantee. Um, here are some axioms that, oh, by the way, so Aaron says um, that's the problem with absolute statements. And every, you know, every time, yes, Aaron is right. He's saying, you know, don't use things like every time and always and never. So bang on right, okay? And in fact, Aaron, when you go on and do yourself, uh, you know, you go and do a master's and a PhD and so forth, they really like to steer way away from absolute statements because absolute statements are never right. Well, hold on, that's an absolute statement. But you're absolutely right, okay? We want to steer away from those. Um, let's see, Jeremy is Mark Zuckerberg, right? Yeah, totally. Um Dogmatic statements being absolute statements. Yes, absolutely. Dogmatic. Hang on. Hang on. Um, dogmatic statements are considered absolute statements most of the time. I would emphatically agree with that. Okay. Um, 
Let's uh, only <laughs> only Siths <laughs> deal in absolutes. You know what? Um, that one's getting a double awesome comment. Okay, let's look at some axioms. Okay, now remember, axioms are are. Um, I'm still hung up on Siths. I love it. Yeah, Hayden, right? Okay, so axioms are like dogma, but they're kind of mottos, sayings, quotes. But once again, they're asserted as incontrovertibly true. So let's take a look at some examples, okay? Follow your passion and you'll never work a day of your life. Oh my gosh. Okay, I got news for you guys. This is my passion. I love this. Okay. I really enjoy teaching. I enjoy technology. I enjoy trying new things. I enjoy learning and growing. I enjoy being a 55 year old dude trying to figure out how to live stream in a compelling, interesting, engaging way. I love it. It's freaking hard work. It is really hard work. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that if you follow your passion, you're going to work so hard your entire life, you're probably going to die early. Okay. Now, I'm just saying that as an example. It's not an assertion uh, necessarily. Maybe it is. But the point is, life is work, man. And so follow your passion and you'll never work a day of your life. It's awfully cute, but not really. Okay. Next one. Um, you can be anything you want. All you have to do is set your mind to it, right? Um, by the way, Jeremy says, yeah, you'll love what you did. Yeah, you'll love it, but it was still hard work and it's still frustrating. And it still makes you want to take vacation once in a while. Um, you can be anything you want. All you have to do is set your mind to it. Oh my gosh, no. No, you can't be anything you want. Um, do you speak French? No? Well, then you can't be a lecturer at the Sorbonne. You can't, okay? Uh, you weigh more than 100 pounds, you can't be a jockey. Can't be a horse jockey. Not a good one. Not one that you'll get paid for, all right? You, th there is no limit to what you can't do. Now, the good news is there's no limit to what you can do, okay? So it's all good. But the idea that you should go off and pursue a dream to which you are extremely ill-fitted um, because, well, all you have to do is set your mind to it and it'll happen. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. All men are created equal. The great thing about this statement is it's, it's the irony is built into the statement. The very fact that we're saying all men are created equal um, means that women are not included, ergo not created equal, meaning this statement is self-evidently contradictory. And yet it's a value that we hold, but we're not equal. Some of us are short, some of us are tall, some of us are wide, some of us are narrow. Some of us uh, really enjoy language. Others don't enjoy language. Other, some rock at math. Some don't rock at math, right? And therefore, you can't do rock at math. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I kill myself. So, no. And yet, this is an assertion. This is an axiom that is constantly stated. By land, they're not making it anymore. Um, yeah. Well, actually, they are making it. They make it in China, literally. Um, but the idea here is that land is always going to be going up in value. Not necessarily. We know that to be not true today. Um, Timothy just said, um, let's see. OK, but using this example you gave, if someone dreams of being a jockey, they could get their weight down to necessary 100 pounds. Well, not if you're six foot eight. Six foot eight might be a little difficult to get down to 100 pounds. OK, um, there are actual constraints that we have. Um, I cannot be the world's youngest chess champion. I'm 55 years old. 
I can't be the world's youngest chess champion. There are constraints that are absolutely insurmountable. So that's what I'm asserting there. Um, although it's still awesome comment. Okay, we had a, I already put you for contributor. Uh, Jeremy, China and Dubai are doing it every day. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really kind of cool. You can look at some cool satellite footage of China and Dubai filling in bays and so forth to create new land. It's great. Okay, um, and then we're going to go to um, everyone has the right to a livable wage. Now we're looking at the progressive side. Everyone has the right to a livable wage. I don't understand how that works economically, okay? That means that no matter, yes, the palm, exactly, Aaron, the palm, you get it. Real world example there, a couple of real world examples. Um, so, you know, the, if you have a right to a livable wage, that means that all I want to do for a living is teach yoga. I just want to teach yoga or I just want to teach Pilates. Okay, well, what's a livable wage and where? A livable wage in the Bay Area is a lot different than a livable wage in Kansas. And if a livable wage in the Bay Area is $150,000 and all you want to do is teach Pilates part time, that might be difficult. Do you have a right that people should pay you more than they're willing? How do you how do you force someone to pay you more than they're willing to pay? Okay? So, just take some critical thinking there, right? Yeah, what defines a livable wage exactly? Um Jeremy, what's the definition of a livable wage living in a remote cabin in Alaska? Yeah, totally cheap, but living in an apartment in New York significantly more. Absolutely the case. And so here's the thing. Now, I want to be really clear. I think everybody should be able to earn a livable wage. There's a difference between having a right to a livable wage versus the ability and right to earn a livable wage. Maybe that's what the statement means, but this is what critical thinking is about. And then we're going to come to my favorite one. Build it and they will come. I cannot tell you how many articles, business articles, we're talking major business articles that love to cite the idea of build it as, and they will come as a form of economic development. Okay. So the idea is if you want to develop the economy of your city or your state, your county and so forth, build things, build infrastructure and build stadiums. And if you build a stadium, they will come, right? And here's the thing about this. This saying is, you called it right, Hayden. This thing is built on the idea of a field of dreams in which Kevin Costner plows under his cornfield because James Earl Jones says, if you do it, people will come and one day you will be able to ca you know, play catch with your dead father's ghost. Okay, so what we're doing is we are building economic strategic plans based on a movie in which somebody wants to play catch with his father's ghost. That makes no sense. That makes no sense at all, right? And yet, here it is, all right? So, yeah. This is my favorite one, all right? And by the way, in that diatribe, we got ourselves to 10 awesome comments, okay? So that means all of you, all of you, um, later on, you're going to send me an email that says what? It says 854.10. Just send me an email that says 854.10. And I'll know that you helped us get here. And we're going to continue to build on this. Okay? Cool. Okay, now it's your turn. Now I want you guys. Uh, yeah, by the way, Aaron, it's a huge corporate gamble. Yeah, 
a gamble based on an axiom from a weird ass movie. Whatever. Okay, your turn. Um uh I want you guys to come up with either a dogma or an axiom that you feel like fits this definition. Something that has been asserted as incontrovertibly true and not really inviting skepticism, questioning, or critical thinking. So um, let's see what uh, you guys can come up with. Okay, let's come back and take a look at some of these. And I'm going to go ahead and come into a full Zoom here. Um, so let's look at these. So Jeremy says, uh, oh, by the way, we have a uh, great real world example earlier from Jeremy. So I'm going to go ahead and add that. Uh, okay, make another cup of coffee when there's less than a cup left. Yeah, totally depends on the time of the day and who's there and so forth. You don't just automatically cut the ends off the roast you know, and you don't just automatically make a cup of coffee. I like it. Or make a new pot. You have to breathe to stay alive. Okay, so I'm not necessarily sure that I can stay alive without breathing. However, I've like, so what's his name? Who's that magician? Um, Blaine, David Blaine. He like trained himself to keep, hold his breath for 17 minutes or something like that crazy nuts and then tom cruise can hold his breath for like seven minutes for a movie stunt that he did it's crazy um good things come to those who wait okay that's a great example of an axiom it's like okay good thing comes good things come to those who wait which kind of says be patient um you know don't buck the system don't push don't harass and so forth and Maybe there are times that good things come to those who wait. So, if you know, if you're building, you know, gardening or something. But oftentimes, no, you got to go out there and get it, right? I, I like it. Um, so, Aaron, uh, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. I love it, right? Now, personally, I go to bed really early and I get up really early but I don't know that that makes me healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? I love it. Um, Jeremy, uh, encouraging employees with negative attitude to um, work for your competitors. I haven't run into that one before, but I like it. Okay, uh, Timothy, I think I'm confused about what you're asking, what we're looking for. Uh, oh, no, now you got it. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah, that's an axiom. The idea being that if you eat right and live a healthy lifestyle, that you will live a healthy life. No, there's no guarantee, my friends. 
my family, many of my family work in the medical industry, and there's plenty of really healthy people who have exercised and taken care of themselves their whole lives and still run into issues. Now, I'm not saying you're not increasing your odds of being healthy by eating right and exercising. I emphatically believe you are increasing your odds, but it's not a guarantee, right? Um, let's see. Uh, um, let's see. The early bird gets the worm. That's a great one, right? Uh, you know, 10 commandments. Yeah. You know, here's the thing. And we're actually, we're going to talk about ethics in this class and we're going to, in these lectures, and we're going to talk about the difference between ethics and morals and commandments, things like that. So Hayden, yeah, your moment is coming there. Um, Joseph, a journey of a thousand mile steps with one footstep. Yeah, good. Um, I kind of agree, but for reasons that are personal to me, but it's still an axiom. You're right. You know, it's still an axiom. Um, can you change the video stream so we can see both your video? Oh, and oh, oh. Let's see, see both your video and the outline. Okay, yes, yes, I can. I can totally do that. I can totally do that. Okay, and then Joseph, a journey, there we go. Yes, yes, a journey, and he, he just changed the typo. I personally like that one, I believe it. On the other hand, it's still an axiom. So just because I agree with the axiom doesn't mean that it's not an axiom that we should not doubt and question and look at critically. Therefore, I have to call myself out on critical thinking because here Joseph is putting up an axiom that I happen to agree with, and I'm having to pause and say, no, no, just because you agree with it doesn't mean it's right. Okay, so good, 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 good. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, 20, uh, 27-year-old tri uh, triathlete. Yeah, well, I do triathlons as well, so I totally get it. Um, um, you love the flower, you've got to let it grow. Yeah, but then it goes to seed, right? Great job, guys, seriously. And I'm going to take us up to, um, I think I've lost track, but I'm pretty darn sure that we've got 10 awesome contributors in all of that. So absolutely good job, all right? I will be taking that into account. So don't worry, you don't have to send a different email, just same email, it'll all be good. Okay, let's go on. Excellent job, folks. Okay, so now let's tie this back to critical thinking. Um, I am going to talk for a moment about vaccinations, immunizations, and so forth. Um, I want to make it really, really clear. Immunizations, vaccinations do not cause autism. However, I am about to show you why critical thinking is really difficult and important because there's actually a lot of things out there that can give somebody really good cause to question that from both dogma as well as axioms, as well as facts, scientific facts, okay? So, dogma. Jenny McCarthy said there was a study that proved vaccines caused autism. Jenny McCarthy went on to Oprah. She shared the study, vaccinations cause autism. Jenny McCarthy is popular, cult of personality. She's on Oprah. She's popular, cult of personality, wide, you know, viewership, and so it got around. Science. The study that she cited and the researcher was debunked, okay? The researcher actually came out and confessed that he manipulated the data. The, the study did not support what he originally supported. Furthermore, numerous additional studies have concluded that there is no link between vaccinations and autism, both the CDC and the World Health Organization support vaccinations, okay? So, the idea that vaccinations are dangerous is ridiculous, right? We're done. Not so fast, 
not so fast. I want to share some things. We're going to look at both dogmas and we're going to look at scientific fact. Let's first look at a couple of scientific facts. The, the, the Tuskegee study, okay? Um, between 1932 and 1972. This is not ancient history, people. U.S. Uh, Public Health Service conducted uh, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis, clinical study, whatever. Uh, to do this, researchers recruited hundreds of African-American males who two-thirds of which had syphilis and told them that as a patient they would receive free health care. At no time were those with syphilis treated for the illness or even informed that they had the condition. This study was a gross violation of medical ethical standards and yet did not come to light until a whistleblower exposed it. Okay, so this is real. All right. What the researchers were really trying to find out is what happens to those who have syphilis and it goes untreated. So they had these patients who went untreated. This is a real documented scientific fact. OK, um, let's look at another one. This one happened just a few years ago, just a few years ago. In 2016, the Philippine government launched a vaccine campaign ad, you know, aimed at fighting dengue, you know, dengue fever. The vaccine had been tested and proven safe in a massive trial with more than 30,000 kids globally. Awesome. Following the study, the results were in the New England Journal of Medicine, a prestigious stamp of approval. So everybody says this is great and fantastic and marvelous and wonderful. But as it turned out, the vaccine raised the risk of hospitalization and plasma leakage syndrome for some kids. Some reports claim that as many as 10 kids died from a result of the vaccine. As it turned out, both the vaccine manufacturer and the Philippine government knew that there was a very small risk for some of the kids. Okay. Now, I want to show you something. These sort of things, these events create a belief system. Remember, we talked about facts, opinions, and beliefs. We've talked about science and dogma and axioms. These sort of actual scientific, scientifically established occurrences create a belief system. These events, some very recent, rightfully cause people to question the whole trust me, I'm from the government proposition. So when somebody says, I don't trust the government, that is a belief system. However, as we talked about in our last lecture, belief systems are often based on past experience, the organizations we belong to, things like that. Now, these both of these cases, I want to make this clear. Ah, I got to remember that this doesn't highlight the whole thing there. Both of these cases were discovered and corrected, as is the way of science. Science is self-correcting. But self-correcting doesn't mean it doesn't make mistakes. OK, um, however, it did create a deep distrust of vaccinations. OK. I want to look at another thing. I want to look at how axioms play into the whole debate around um, vaccines. We like to say that parents know best when it comes to the health and wel welfare and upbringing of their child. The parent always knows best. That's cuckoo bananas, okay? Um, few parents are certified child psychologists, pediatricians, educators, moral philosophers, all rolled into one. Trust me, I'm a parent with five kids, and I wing it each and every day. We make this crap up as it, we go along. And I regularly rely on the expertise of experts to help me navigate these treacherous waters. And yet, because we kind of say as an axiom, parents know best, then 
when a parent says, I will not vaccinate my child, we back off because the axiom posits that it's an uncontrovertible truth that a parent knows best. Okay, so here's the point I'm trying to make. Oh, one more thing. We get into echo chambers, right? Evidence supports our position. Evidence that supports our position is enhanced and championed, while evidence that disagrees with us is tossed away as flawed, incomplete, or fake news. This is the antithesis, the opposite of critical thinking. Critical thinking does not say embrace everything that agrees with you. You should question what agrees with you. Critical thinking does not say reject everything that disagrees with you. You should look at the things that disagree with you. All right. This is what critical thinking is about. However, um, one more thing, science itself, while self-correcting, is on a never-ending journey. Okay, here's a great quote from an episode of NPR's uh, a report on NPR. And this is from Brian Nosex, a uh, psychology and researcher at the University of Virginia. He says, our best methodologies to try to figure out truth mostly reveal to us that figuring out truth is really hard. Even science struggles with what is truth. And we're going to get contradictions. One year, we're going to learn that coffee is good for us. There's your coffee, Jeremy. The next year, we're going to find out that it's bad for us. The next year, we're going to find out that we don't know. But that's because science is self-correcting, constantly questioning itself. I bring all this up to demonstrate to you that something as clear-cut as vaccinations, immunizations, can in fact be really controversial. I want to reiterate, vaccinations do not cause autism. They don't do it. Get your shots, get your immunizations, get your children's shots, your children's immunizations, do it. However, don't think for a moment that those that have issues with the practice don't have a leg to stand on. There's science, there's axioms, there's dogma, there are belief systems that are really, really powerful and pull us away from the truth, which is vaccinations are awesome and fantastic. Okay. Um, let's see. By the way, I saw a comment here from Jeremy in one of my writing classes. Oh, bam. <laughs> there we go. Um, I had to do extensive scientific research project and had to have... Um, you know, scholarly research to back the paper. Many of my classmates, you know, you know, here's the thing. Yeah, scholarly research. And yes, scholarly research is the bomb. You want scholarly research. However, even scholarly research changes, right? It's because science is self-correcting. Science, if you ever find science saying, we now know the incontrovertible truth, we no longer need to study this, that's not science. It has now slipped into dogma, and that's dangerous. Okay, now, one of the things that uh, come up in the reading that you've been exploring with uh, Edward Ng is talking about this idea of business as a science, okay? Um by the way, a real quick note from Aaron, the U.S. government, FDA approved anthrax vaccine for the troops. Yeah, only to change their mind. That's a really good example. I ought to add that to this. Yeah, really good. Okay, um, that's more of a real world example. So, well, no, 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 no. There we go. Okay, Edward Ng, he says, physics and math are sciences. But business and engineering are the application of science. They use laws discovered elsewhere for their own purposes. So um, here's the thing. When someone asks, does Edward Ng think that business is a science? No, business is not a science. It is a messy, constantly moving, changing, amorphic 
activity in which we engage as as human beings and animals for that matter we'll talk about that next week but it applies science but that doesn't mean it is a science which is why this next paragraph is important sometimes there is a danger in using an application without remembering the source without keeping the source of an idea in one's mind it, you know, we can make false associations. So, for example, Field of Dreams is used as a source for building stadiums because build it and they will come. Forgetting that the source is a fictional fairy tale movie. All right. That's where we're using an application without remembering the source. OK. All right. Business as a science continued here. This is an, uh, another assertion that Edward makes. Investors treat capital as if it were perpetual and infinite. Investors assume that their interest in capital are just as real as the laws of physics. They are not. Okay? And this leads to all kinds of problems. So here's the thing. We often, let's say that you want to get into... Um, Let's say you want to get into um, investing. That's fine. That's great. It's a great field to go into. And there's going to be lots of software, lots of graphs, lots of charts, lots of information available to you. Um, don't think for a moment that it's science. Not science. It is weird, funky, psychological terror and all kinds of weird, amorphic, behavioral things all coming together. Um, uh, okay, uh, is blurring for some reason. My video is blurring. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so I'll tell you what, we're just going to go there then. I apologize. I'm not sure why my video is blurring. Uh, thank you for letting me know. I will troubleshoot that afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I'll take a look at that. But that's our lecture for today. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, be sure to send me the email. All of you who participated in this live stream, you all get credit for that. And um, let me know. Uh, watch the HBO series Billions. Oh, OK, I will. I haven't heard of that one. I'll, I'll see if I can if I can find that, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, Everyone, thank you very much. If you have any questions, any comments, if you want to continue the discussion, I'm going to stay here on the comments for a little while. Otherwise, you have a phenomenal day and an even better three-day weekend coming up soon. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks a lot.